What's going on guys, it's Cooper Codes. And in this video, we are going to be building this GPT-4 chat application that has GPT-4 streaming and is fully deployed with Next.js 13. As you can see, if we have a user message here and we send the message in, we are going to get a response from GPT-4 that is being streamed to our client from a server-side function. To achieve this functionality, we are going to be using the Versal AI SDK, which allows us to create functionality just like this, where we have a full chat application and we only need a handful lines of code. This was recently announced by Versal and they've added a bunch of amazing features to it. And just to show you guys, we can keep on asking questions just like if we were talking to ChatGPT. So for example, here I can say, can you explain algorithms more? Then I can send that question in and I'm going to get a consistent chat log back and forth and it's going to remember that context. You guys can also see that this is a Next.js 13 application that is fully deployed to Versal. This means we are going to handle a bunch of things such as turning your AI functionality into something that's going to run at scale and also doing things like making sure your API keys are secret when you deploy this to a bunch of users. All right. Let's get into the code. To get started, we can create our Next.js 13 application by going to an empty folder and opening up the command line and then typing in npx create dash next dash app at latest. Then I'm going to add some options to the command line, such as dash dash ts to add TypeScript, dash dash tailwind to add tailwind and dash dash eslint. We can then press enter to get started. If it asks you to install the latest version of create next app, say yes. I'm going to name this project gpt-chat, but you can name it whatever you want. Not going to use the source directory, so just press enter. We are going to use the app router, so say yes, or just press enter. We don't need to change this, so just say no. And then it's going to fully build our Next.js 13 application. There are going to be two important packages we need to install. So let's get into our application in the command line by saying cd gpt-chat. That's going to get us into the folder over here. And then we can say npm install AI. AI is the package for the Versal AI SDK, which makes chat applications and chat streaming way easier than doing it yourself. Then we also need to install openAI-edge. This allows us to run OpenAI functionality on an edge function. The OpenAI edge package allows us to create server-side functionality using OpenAI. So we can keep our API keys safe, for example, and we can also just use OpenAI functionality on the server side. So we can press enter. All right, so our package.json should look something like this, which is great news. Now we are going to want to set up the actual API keys to talk with OpenAI. This is just something I'm going to get out of the way early in the video, so we have the API key when we need it. But go to platform.openai.com and create an account, whatever that process looks like, and eventually you will come to this page here. From this page, we can go to the top right of the screen and go to view API keys. You might have a list of empty keys if you just created your account, but we can go right here and press create new secret key. We can name the key. I'm going to call this video test key, create the key with the button here and make sure to copy the entire string it gives you here because it's only ever going to show you this secret key once. So once the screen goes away, it's gone forever. So we can copy this and then press done. Now, if we want to use this API key within our Next.js 13 application, we can go over to our folders here, make sure you're in the main root folder and create a file called .env.local. This is a file where we can store local environment variables. For example, we can say open AI underscore API underscore key is equal to a string which is going to be that key we got before. And so to understand what we just did here, what we can look at is we just made an environment variable called openAI underscore API underscore key. And throughout our Next.js application, we can go to process.env dots, and then the name of our variable to reference this value. So anywhere throughout your application, it's going to give us that string like that. But now that we have all this set up, make sure to save this file, make sure it looks like this. And we can go into the app folder here and start editing our page.tsx to make a pretty basic user interface. You'll see if we npm run dev, that's going to start up our local server. And we can go to the local link here, and it's going to have a bunch of boilerplate stuff from Next.js. For our interface, we are going to make it super simple, so we honestly don't need any of this. To make things simple, I'm going to delete everything except this outside main tag. So we can go in here and just delete everything inside of here. Scroll down and then make sure you don't delete main. So your application should eventually look something like this. And so if we go over to our application now, you will see that we just have a completely blank screen, which is exactly what we want. 
I'm going to make a div. This is going to be in the middle of our screen to kind of hold our chat application. You can create the styling however you want, but for this tutorial, I'm going to create a very basic Tailwind CSS layout. So to use Tailwind, we can say class name is equal to. I'm going to make this div have a background of a slate. Let's say 800 looks like it could work. And it's going to have a padding of three. So on every single side, it's going to have a little bit of padding. And then it's going to give it a width of 800 pixels just to keep things simple. I'm then going to round the corners by saying rounded dash MD. It's going to give us some rounded corners. And I'm going to make sure any text inside of here is going to be white. So I'm going to say text dash white. So you should have something that looks like this. Let's go and create a basic title for our application. So we can go in here and say that there's an H2 at the top that says GPT for streaming chat application. I'm going to make the class name be equal to some Tailwind classes. So if we want to make a larger text in Tailwind, we can say text dash 2XL is one of the font options there and then we can save that and you'll see now we have a basic card to put all of our different chat functionality within one thing that i'm about to do is i'm about to make a new component called chat component and you might think why well, make a new component right well the chat component is going to need access to the client because it has text inputs which have on change events and that means that we need to make a client side component and so right now the entirety of home here is actually a server side component and so if we make a folder within GPT chat and just call it components like this, then we can go in here and make the name of our component. For example, chat component.tsx. Inside of here, we can make a very basic React component and just for now say export default function. So a functional React component, chat component. Just like any React component, it's going to return some JSX. For now, I'm just going to make a div with an H1 saying hello. <laughs> we can then go back to our page.tsx, import the chat component we just made, and then put it right under our h2 right here. So you can just say chat component like this. And importantly, we want to make sure to go over to chat component and make it a use client component so it can use any of that client functionality we need when we actually build the chat here. So you'll see, although it's pretty basic, we do have a little hello showing, which means our chat component is being rendered to our client, which is great. So let's go and create a pretty basic form for our user to input some text into. So I'm going to go into the chat component and I'm going to create a form at the bottom of our div here. I'm going to give it a class name of margin top of 12. This is going to separate it because right above here, we are eventually going to have our text messages when we create that functionality. So inside of our form, I'm just going to create a little paragraph that says user message and then a text area for our user to put their text into. To give it some styling, I'm going to say the class name is equal to margin top of two. So it separates between the text width of full background of slate. Let's say 800 and just see what that looks like. We can change that if it doesn't look great. And then a padding of two. Then a placeholder is kind of some initial text to show to our user to give an example of what they should say. I'm going to make like a software engineer and robot. So I'm going to say, what are data structures? and algorithms. Okay, so I think that the background color looks good enough for this application. Now we need to make a button so the user can actually send messages in. Going to go down here and say button like this, and it's going to say send message. Then I'm going to make a class name be equal to rounded dash MD. So it's going to be a rounded kind of button. Then background of blue dash 600, which is a nice blue color from Tailwind, as you can see right here. Then a padding of two, and a margin top of two. All right, so this is a pretty basic user interface, but it's clean enough to have all of our different functionality in there. We are going to load in messages as they come in from our API. So we're gonna show all the messages that we get, of course. But for now, I'm just gonna make a quick example message so we can make those dynamically in the future. So I'm just gonna make a little div for an example message. I'm gonna make an H3, which is going to show the role of who's actually talking for the certain message. So this is going to have a class name of text dash large font dash semi bold is kind of good to make something stand out and then a margin top of two you guys will see I use margin top of two a lot here so just to make this spacing consistent everywhere so let's just say GPT-4 is talking in this one although we're going to make it say GPT-4 or user based off the message which I'll talk about later and the actual content of the message will just be some simple paragraphs saying I am a robot with GPT-4 so let's go see what that looks like. All right, so this is great. Now we have a specific way to actually interpret messages and show them to the user. So once we actually get data from our API, which we're about to build, we can show the person who's talking and then also the message. 
And so you guys don't have to copy this, but just as an example, if we were to have the user next, which usually the user is going to have the first question, which ChatGPT, but I'll have him be second and I'll say, I am a user. We can save that and see that we have a pretty basic chat application, which is great. So the Versal AI SDK or the AI package that we installed has this incredibly important React hook called use chat. Use chat gives us access to a bunch of different things. For example, it handles messages for us. So we don't even have to add messages to an array or take messages away from an array. And it also handles the user input, handling user submits, and a bunch of things relevant to creating a chat application in Next.js. So we can go to the top here and then import use chat from AI slash React. And then we can initialize the React hook by saying use chat like this. And use chat gives us access to a bunch of different functionality that Versal has created for us. So we could say const and then do object destructuring is what this is called. And we can get a bunch of different objects outside of the use chat hook. For example, there is an input const that we can use for the current value of our user input, the handle input change, which allows us to change this input when the input changes, surprise, right? And then handle submit. So once we actually send in a message to our backend, we can use the handle submit here. There's also an is loading property that we're not going to use in this tutorial, but it's good to know that it exists. Then also messages. Messages is incredibly important because what messages does is it is an array. So messages will look like this. It'll have user asks a question, GPT-4 responds, user asks again, GPT-4 responds. And this is kind of a pseudocode way of looking at it, but our messages array is pretty much going to be a bunch of objects that represent this. And just to show you guys, we can console.log messages. And because it's on our client, remember with the use client right here, we're going to be able to see this in our console log. And you'll see right now our messages is an array with zero messages in there. So we can go back to our Next.js application and we can take these values and make them equal to the values of our inputs down here. For example, for our text area, which is what the user is inputting, we are going to say the value is equal to the input, which is coming from this use chat hook. So the chat input is how you could think about that. Then the on change is handle input change, which is going to update this input to whatever the current user is saying. And then if this form ever gets submitted, for example, if we press that button, it's going to submit the form. We can then say on submit handle submit right here. And just for example's sake, I'm going to console.log the input to show you guys what's currently happening. So if I ask hello world question mark, <laughs> you can see that our current input is getting updated to that current value in the text box. An interesting thing here is if we press send message, take a look at what happens, it's going to give us an error, which we actually expect. The interesting thing is that the actual use chat hook that we're using expects us to have an API route built at API slash chat, and it expects us to handle a post request to this route. The cool thing about this API route is that it can be 100% server side. That means you don't have to do any API calling directly to OpenAI from your client. So in order for this post request to be fulfilled and actually give us a good response is we can go and create this functionality that calls the data from OpenAI and then sends a stream to our front end. That's also how we do the streaming data. So let's get started on building out this API route. As you can see, it's expecting it to be at API slash chat. So we can go into our application, create an API folder, because remember the routing in Next.js 13 is folder based. So if we are going to API slash chat, we're literally gonna to go to our app folder, which is the root, create API, and then create a chat folder, just like that. Inside of chat, we can make something called a route.ts. So route.ts is a type of file within Next.js 13 that allows us to have route handlers. And if you're like, what is a route handler? Don't worry. It allows us to handle certain requests to this specific route. So for example, right now we are on localhost 3000 slash API slash chat. And so based off that front end call, we want to handle a post request to this specific route. So in order to handle that request, we can create a route.ts and then create a function specifically for posts that allow us to handle that. And we can do that by literally saying export async function like this. And these functions are recognized by their actual function name. So it has to be exactly posts like this. And it's going to take in a request from our front end, which we can type to capital request like that. And inside of our request, we're actually going to get access to specific things. For example, this array of messages is going to be within our request body, which we can get access to by saying await request.json. 
And so if request.json is an object of data, and within there we have a messages array like this, one way to get the value of messages out of that is to say const object syntax like this is equal to await request.json. And then we have whatever properties you want to get out of it. For example, messages like this. If we were to have like Cooper is equal to codes or something like that, and we wanted to get the Cooper value out, we could just do Cooper like this, just to give an example of a different value. That's not a real value inside of our body, so we can get rid of that. And so just to bring this comment down, literally this function will resolve this specific post request. And so I'm going to comment out some things that we are going to do in this post request. First thing that we are going to do is we are going to create a chat completion, which is just a fancy way of saying get response from GPT-4. We are then going to create a stream of data from OpenAI. And so this allows us to stream data to the front end, just like you would with ChatGPT. And then we are going to send the stream as a response to our client slash front end. That's going to be the process here. And so this sending the stream back is what resolves the post. It's going to ask for something, and then we're going to resolve the request by eventually returning a stream. First things first, though, we actually have to initialize everything with OpenAI. So at the top, we can say import configuration and open AI API or actually like this from openai-edge like that. We can then also import the openai stream and then the streaming text response, which I will talk about more as we use them. In order to make this server-side function, which is incredibly important to realize this is a server-side function, right? We need to export const runtime is equal to edge. So edge functions are part of Versal and they provide optimal infrastructure for our API route. And if you guys want, there is a link I have here. If you want to look more into what this is, you can go to edge-runtime.versal.app and it talks a bunch about it. And so now that we're set up with the edge runtime, we can use the OpenAI edge package here to set up our configuration. And so I'm gonna say const config is equal to new configuration, which is coming from up here. It's going to take some parameters. For example, the most important thing it takes, and the only thing we're gonna give it here is API key. That's gonna be equal to process dot env dot open ai underscore api underscore key and we get access to this open ai underscore api key because it is inside our dot env dot local right here and then to set up a way to communicate with open ai we could say const open ai is equal to new open ai api and then the configuration object that we just made right here all right, so now we're good to go when it comes to using OpenAI on the server side. We can then use the OpenAI API to create a chat completion. So we're going to say const response is equal to await OpenAI.createChatCompletion. This is going to ask some questions when we send in our response. Inside of an object here, we can then put some options as to what we want from the chat completion. For example, we need to tell it which model we want, which is going to be GPT-4. If we wanted to stream data, so in this example, we are going to say stream is equal to true. And then importantly, what are the messages of the conversation so far? So GPT-4 knows what to respond to and knows all the context. So we can say messages is equal to the messages here. It's important to recognize that messages is instantly going to have our user object inside there. So the message object is going to be pretty simple. It's pretty much going to be the user and he says, hello there. That's kind of a more pseudocode way of looking at it, but just know that there's gonna be a bunch of objects here. And to see what these objects are, we can always console.log messages. When we have this array of messages, it's important to understand that GPT-4 and chat completions have a very important message at the beginning, which we can use, and it's called the system message. The system message tells GPT-4 how to act. It's the most simple way of viewing it. And it should always be at the front of your array. And so a simple way of adding a system message to your already existing array of messages is creating a new array like this, saying dot, dot, dot messages. That means it's going to take all of the messages from this initial array and put them in this other array. And then on top of all those messages, we can create a new message that's always going to be at the beginning. Its role is going to be system. So the system message, right? And its content is going to be however you want GPT-4 to act. For example, I can say you are a helpful assistant. And also you explain software concepts simply to intermediate programmers. So now GPT-4 knows how to act. This is where you can do a bunch of crazy stuff too. Like if you say like talk like a pirate, it will always talk like a pirate. 
And that functionality comes from the system message here. And so when this OpenAI chat completion is done, it's going to give us a response. We need to then get the stream out of this response. This is kind of a complicated process, but not here. So we can just say const stream is equal to await open AI stream. So open AI stream is a function that we imported from above, right? And it's a helper function that allows us to put in the response from the chat completion and turn it into a stream that we can then send to our front end. Remember that this response isn't the stream itself. So this does some logic to actually get the stream of data out of our response, which is super helpful. Once we eventually have this stream of data, we can then return it to our front end by saying return new streaming text response and then pass in the stream we want to return. It's common for us to return a response at the end of anything inside of our route.ts. So you always return a response. This streaming text response right here gives us a certain format to return the stream in a way where we don't have to worry about it. As long as you have the stream here, it's then going to return to the front end in a way that our chat component is going to be able to understand. Because remember, when it returns this streaming text response, all the functionality as to how it gets loaded into our application is actually handled by the use chat hook over here. So it's going to kind of seem like magic, but it's because a lot of the functionality is being handled by use chat. So right now, assuming that our backend call works here, we should be able to get a bunch of messages that we're going to see in the console, but they will not be displayed to our users quite yet. So let's make sure to save all of our files here, and then we can go back over to our application. So make sure to refresh your application, and you should have an empty array over here to start. Sometimes it'll cache the messages, so be careful of that. And if we input a user message, remember the input's getting listened to, so it can say, what does hello world mean in programming? And then we can send a message in and you'll see we're going to be getting a bunch of responses. You'll see this is things going a bunch. It's because it's updating our messages object on every single token. And that's kind of how you get the streaming response is on every single word is the way you can think about it. It's going to send in a completely new refreshed version of this array. So by the end, the content of the message is going to look something like this. Hello world may is the first program that beginner programmers write. Okay. And it's giving us an example in Python, an example in Java. So there you go. Pretty cool. And so you can see that we're getting the full response back. And so now we need a way to actually show the different messages to our front end. So you'll see an important thing about each message is it has a content and it has a role. So when the user's talking, it'll say user. And when the robot's talking, it'll say assistant. And because this is an array and we're in React, we know that we can map over this array to create unique components for each message. So let's go into our chat component.tsx and we can say messages.map. And this is going to have our current message object, which I'm then going to point to an arrow function like this. And it's not going to like this comment anymore, so I'm going to get rid of that real quick. So I'm going to return a bunch of JSX here, which we can do by just saying return, and then some parentheses like this. And I'm going to make a div that is going to have a key of message.id. Then we can close a div like this. And just to make our lives easier here, you actually type this message to the message type it's already recognizing here. So I'm going to say colon message like this. And it's not showing up, which is hilarious, but we want the message type specifically from AI slash React. So go up here and say comma message like this. And now it's going to give us a type to see all the different information of a message, which is going to make this next part way easier. So one quick thing I'm just going to structure this up out into is I'm going to have two comments. One of them is going to be name of person talking is the first thing we're going to make here. And then the message, which is going to require some formatting as well. So to get the name of the person talking, we can do some ternary logic here. And we can say if the message dot role is equal to assistant, for example, we can then say if that is true, then I want to show an h3 with the GPT four. And we actually made this functionality already down here or these little components. So I'm going to take this H3 here, paste it in right here. That's the component we want to show if it is the assistant. And then we can do a colon, which pretty much means else. We can have an H3 that's going to instead just say user. And so that's like a simple kind of way to do an if else statement in React. And just for, you know, making it look nice, it kind of looks better if you format it like this in your code. So you can kind of see what you're looking at. There you go. And so under the user's name, we are going to want to have a message, which we can do down here. We can get access to the user's actual content of their message by going in here. I'm going to make some more curly braces because we're going to do some JavaScript again. And on the curly brace here, I'm going to say message.content.split by the new line. And you're like, why are you splitting it by the new line, right? 
Well, let's go over to the output on our website real quick. You'll see that when ChatGPT talks, it creates new lines on purpose. And so we can see these new lines by looking for the backslash new line. In order to make things look nice on our front end, we have to recognize these new lines and then create gaps on our front end over here to make it look just like this. So for example, we can split it by the new line and then we can map over that array. And so this is going to map over all of the current text blocks is what I'm gonna call them, which are just going to be strings. And because it's splitting by the new line, some of these are going to be empty string. I'm just going to reuse this comment here. Hopefully you guys don't mind to explain this. Where let's say if we had the text, Cooper Codes is a YouTuber. Then it has a new line and it says he makes software content. And then it has a new line and it says you should subscribe. It's kind of biased from GPT-4, but you know, I understand. And so what we can do is we can turn this into something that looks more like this. So you can take that whole thing above assuming it's just these lines and this split by new line is going to turn it into an array that looks something like this. The first string here is actually going to turn this line into an empty string like that. And then he makes software content like that. Then on that new line, it's going to have an empty string again. And then you should subscribe. It's going to be just like this. And so when we map over these strings inside of our split, we can actually show them to our front end in a different way if it's an empty space. And so I'm going to point this current text block to an arrow function like this. Oh, and it's going to get mad for random reasons because we don't have a return statement. So just make a blank return like that and we should be good. There we go. And we can also bring this thing in like this. If the current text block is equal to an empty string, just like we discussed down here, I'm going to instead make a paragraph that is literally just a space. So I'm going to say return. You can do the ampersand NBSP like this. This is just a syntax for showing a space like this in your JavaScript. Because if you actually just did a space like this, it's not actually going to show anything, which is a problem. <laughs> so one way of manually putting a space in there is using this NBSP thing. And if it is not a empty string, that means we actually have a message to return. So we can say return and then just whatever is in the current text block, which for example, is going to be the text like this. So hopefully that logic kind of makes sense, although we have to use a kind of a lot of JavaScript stuff to show this to our front end. I believe React also gets mad if we don't have these paragraphs with a certain unique key. So one thing we can do is we can get the index right here, and that is going to be a number. So we might as well type that because we're in TypeScript. So these paragraphs can have a key that is going to be equal to the message dot ID plus the index. So we know specifically which index we're on, and that's going to make a unique paragraph key for every single thing here. And then we can do the same thing down here as well. So I know this is kind of a complicated way of doing it, but initially we are mapping over every single message here. Then we're creating a little tag that is showing the name of the person talking. And then down here, I'll just make a comment to show you guys. We are then formatting the message. And then this is just an example where you can delete this if you guys follow it along here. And so now we can go into our project and actually see this working. So we do have those messages from before that I forgot about. So we can go back into our application and they're right down here and we can get rid of them. So we can get rid of all this and you should have no messages initially. So let's go back. All right, so I'm gonna ask GPT-4, what are data structures? Let's see what it says. There we go. And so you can see as the actual messages array is getting updated, it's showing new data to our client, which is amazing. Oh, it's, it's telling us every single data structure. Uh oh, this is an expensive API call. And there you go. So just to show you guys, we can also keep on asking. It's going to recognize our context too, because it has all those messages. I'll inspect here, saved into the console here, right? We can then go in there and say, can you explain hash tables in 50 words or less? Let's, let's see what it does. You can send the message in. Dang, it did it. There we go. And so this allows you to talk to ChatGPT4 in your applications, which is amazing. And one really cool thing about this project is that the actual API calls are being run server side. So we're not exposing our API key anywhere. The thing about running ChatGPT at scale is that if you ever expose your API key, it could be very expensive, right? So you gotta be careful about that. All right, so now we can actually deploy this project to Versal. So I'm gonna go over to my terminal and I'm going to clear it out here. And I'm going to say NPX Versal Logout. You guys do not have to do this. This is just to show you guys, I'm gonna show you the full process. So I'm logging out of my own Versal account here. All right, so now I'm gonna be just alongside you guys because I'm assuming you're not logged in at all. So we can then say NPX Versal, which is the command that deploys our Versal application. And if you're confused, like is it Versal deploy or anything? No, it's just NPX Versal. You can then press enter. 
I have a GitHub account that I have connected to Versal, so I'm going to press enter on continue with GitHub. For whatever you guys use, you can use the arrow keys and select the right one. Whichever one you're on, then press enter. This then sent me to a website and it automatically logged me in because I was already logged in on Versal.com. But if you don't have an account, I believe there will be a setup here and eventually it will tell you that you're good to go here. If you ever get lost in the process, you can always just run npx versal again, especially like maybe you deleted your command line accident or something. But if we go back, we're going to see my authentication is good. It's going to ask me if I want to deploy this specific project. I'm going to say yes. I'm then going to say yes to my specific scope, which is my GitHub account here. I'm not going to want to link it to an existing project. I think I already have a project named GPT chat. So I'm going to say GPT dash chat dash video for this one. Uh, our directory is located right where we asked for npx versal so we can just press enter and then you're going to say no to modifying the settings here because we don't need to it's then going to build our project on versal this is going to take a second and i would be careful not to touch anything but eventually we are going to see our project and set up the actual environment variables to set up environment variables such as our openai api key on an actual production environment it can't just look at env.local you have to go onto versal and put them in manually so i'll show you guys how to do that all right, so if you go to the actual production environment and then open it up, let's go. So it has it, but one thing's gonna mess us up. I'm gonna say, what are programmers? That's kind of a philosophical question, but if I press send message, it's not gonna work. And you're gonna be like, what, what happened? It's because our backend right now does not have the actual API key to run at production. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go to your Versal dashboard. So go to versal.com and then log into the same account you use to deploy your application. For example, I'm on my GitHub account, and so I'm going to go to gpt-chat-video. So if you go over to this site, you're going to see it's uh, showing my current website, which is great news. The one thing that we need to do is we need to go into settings. Inside of settings, we are then going to go to environment variables. These are all the environment variables that are available to all of your different environments. Most importantly for us, production. And so Versal actually makes this really easy. You can go over to your .env.local file here, and copy everything. So if you have more than just these, you can copy them too. Go back over here and then press enter and it will get everything right for you. Make sure that production is checked. So make sure everything here is checked. I'm not sure it matters if this one's checked, but make sure it's checked, I guess. And we can press save. This now means that inside of our environments, we have an open AI underscore API key. Important thing is in order to get this to work, we need to deploy to production again. So what I'm gonna do, is I'm just gonna go to our route.ts and I'm gonna make a new line. And that's all I'm gonna do. We can then go back into our command line and I'm gonna say npx versal, and sorry, this is hard to see, it's in the bottom, but I'm saying npx versal dash dash prod to make sure it deploys to production, press enter. All that login stuff from before should be cached. So it's just going to deploy right away. All right, so if you see this check and production, that means it's deployed to the production environment successfully. So we can go in there, open up the website. And this is a pretty serious application we've made here. It has all the data being managed correctly on the client side. And then we also have that server side GPT-4 function that also handles the streaming of data. So we can ask the classic question, what are data structures and algorithms? And there we go. Let's send the message in and it's gonna stream a response back to us, which is really cool. So now you have a way to interact with GPT-4 in any deployed Next.js 13 application, which is amazing. If you made it to the end of the video, I would recommend to check out my newsletter service called Code Letter. It's all about giving you everything you need to know about in software engineering in three minutes or less. This isn't a sponsorship or anything. This is 100% my product. So I'm genuinely trying to give you guys a cool service here. If you're interested in something like this, feel free to go over to thecodeletter.com and subscribe. And if you made it this far in the video, I just want to say thank you so much for watching.